Thank you, Priya, for the opportunity to talk at the Shrewsbury Public Library. Uh, once again, I apologize for not being there in person. I, I really wish I hadn't tested positive for COVID this morning, but uh, in order to carry out the talk and uh, not having uh, people disappointed for not, not being able to, to hear about AI, then uh, I, uh, we, we're going to do this on Zoom. And, um, and we're going to have time for, for uh, questions at the end. Uh, so I, I would like to start this talk uh, by asking if you have used ChatGPT. I know that many of you probably have, had, have, have used it. So this probably gives you a sense of how AI has now more than ever a profound impact in our lives. So it's, it's natural to wonder uh, how education will change now that our kids can ask large language models to write their essays. But ChatGPT is in reality only the tip of the iceberg. You may not know, but there are many other changes underway in healthcare services and even in the way people do their jobs. As I speak tonight, AI is being used for, for high stake decisions such as guiding uh, job and school admissions, drug discovery processes, and even pretrial detention and release. So considering the major role played by these AI models today, if you are curious to learn more about these technologies, you're not alone, right? A lot of people want to know. So it is uh, very important to try and get a better understanding of what is AI exactly, whether you are a tech enthusiast, a concerned citizen, or a high school student with a curious mind. So um, again, if you haven't tried ChatGPT yet, you definitely should. Um, some examples of things that it can do is, if you're looking for sneaker recommendations, any kind of product recommendations, you can essentially type uh, and you can give details about what kinds of things you want to do. Uh, recipe suggestions, you have a bunch of stuff in your fridge uh, that, is, uh, that is about to go bad and you don't know what to cook with okra and thyme. So uh, you can get recipe suggestions, jokes. You can use it as a personal tutor to study something, learn about something that you don't know well. Uh, even creating some basic code uh, if you're learning if you're learning how to code and you don't know how to do certain things improving your uh, social skills language translation and one thing I've used before when I uh, went to Newport in Rhode Island is to create a tip it, a trip itinerary so those are all kinds of things you can easily do for free using chat GPT uh, one of the coolest usages I've seen on the internet is uh, this person who took a photo of a bunch of parking restrictions and said, it's Wednesday at 4 p.m. Can I park at this spot right now? Tell me in one line. And the answer is yes, you can park for one hour starting at 4 p.m. So I, I, I can relate to that picture. I've Many times I've been facing a bunch of signs and I didn't know whether to park or not and I got a parking ticket at the end. So I wish chat GPT was, was available at back then. So, now, uh, let's try to understand a little bit of what is AI, what people are referring to when they, they, they say AI, right? It turns out that ideas regarding AI have been floating around since the 50s. It's not a new thing. Alan Turing was this English mathematician, computer scientist, logician, crypt analyst, philosopher, and theoretical biologist. He uh, is considered the father of both artificial intelligence and theoretical computer science. So in the 50s, he came, uh, he wrote a paper that aimed to define intelligence. How can we tell if a machine is intelligent? So he proposed something called the Turing test. And in the Turing test, you have a human uh, represented by the letter C here uh, that is behind a wall communicating by uh, like using a keyboard and, and a monitor, a screen with either a computer A or a person B. So these, these people are behind a wall, right? The computer and the person B are behind a wall. And if a human, if the human cannot tell reliably when it's communicating with the computer or when it's communicating with the other human, then we can, we can tell that the, the machine has achieved uh, intelligence. 
So um, we this this idea have been have been have inspired a movie called The Imitation Game. You may have watched this one with Benedict Cumberbatch. This film has received eight Academy Award nominations. It's a great movie about Alan Turing, and it it helps us understand this this the, the context in which the thing these things developed. So a few years later, uh, there was a workshop at Dartmouth, not too far away from here, when these folks here, uh, so they, they, they got together for, for several weeks and they were trying to debate whether machines can be capable of simulating human intelligence. So some of these folks that you see in the picture, along with some others, were later, later became known as the godfathers of AI because they were the first ones to kind of try to formulate these ideas, the first programs. And they even coined this new term, which was before machine intelligence. And now it started to be called artificial intelligence or just AI. So in the years that followed, many programs were developed, including programs that could solve algebra problems, uh, prove simple geometry theorems, and learn how to speak simple English. Following that workshop, uh, there was a huge hype uh, and the, the government came along and, and funded a lot of the research in AI. And the, the predictions were very, very optimistic. They, they were uh, maybe not so realistic. So if it, in 58, they said in 10 years, the computers will beat the world's chess champion. They will discover and prove an important math theorem. And this happened, but not, not within the 10 years, right? They said that in 65, that in 20 years, computers will be capable of doing any work a man can do. And as you may suspect, we're not there yet. They also said that in the 70s, that in three to eight years, a machine with general intelligence of an average human being would, would be created. And, and because of that, that uh, there was a huge investment, huge funding coming from DARPA and, and agencies in the UK. Well, turns out the public expectations were impossibly high and the promised results were, were not delivered, right? So if we had any lesson from that, it's just that we, just, we don't just simply simulate human intelligence, right? So this is, this is something very difficult to do. So then it came the first AI winter um, with the deception, with the, the disappointment. So even the most imp impressive programs could only handle the trivial versions of the problems they were intended to solve. And, and uh, during that time, several limitations were found that uh, just contribute to that winter. So uh, the computers were just very, very limited. The most powerful computer only had the, 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 the compute power. Uh, the, the compute power is still 10 times less powerful than the human retina in terms of number of images it can process in a second. Also, some theoretical limitations were found in terms of combinatorial explosions that com the computers could not treat. And uh, computers were not just not capable of human sense. Uh, I'm sorry, common sense. So after this, this first AI winter, AI had started to blossom again uh, with the rise of uh, expert systems. Those were systems that shifted the focus from common sense, trying to instill common sense to the machines, towards uh, knowledge, really uh, programs, uh, computers that were created to answer specific questions or solve problems in a specific domain. So these uh, expert systems were developed by corporations worldwide, which created in-house AI departments. And they, they, they would host huge computers. That's when the money started to come back to AI. Japan in particular had this very ambitious project called the fifth computer generation, which had funds to develop programs capable of translating, interpreting pictures and human-like reasoning. So these investments were later followed by the UK, uh, companies and government in the US. So not, not surprisingly, right? So uh, there was a second winter after the hype 
And when people realized that these expert systems were just too expensive to maintain, too expensive to upgrade, because they required very specialized hardware. At the same time, desktop computers by Apple and IBM were gaining power and speed. So that's the first computer by Apple, very different than computers that we have nowadays. And Japan's goals had, had just not been met, right? So the, this industry, right, um, from one day to another, just <clears throat> had, had just completely failed. It was demolished, uh, it was worth half a billion dollars and literally from, from one day to the other, it had just disappeared. <clears throat> so the AI, AI's name got tarnished and after that, some progress continued to occur, but the computer scientists, they didn't want to be associated with the name AI, right? Because whenever you hear AI, uh, people would recall this wild eye dreamers, people who are just out of this, the, the reality. Uh, one of the major achievements was in 97, when IBM created this computer called Deep Blue, which finally beat the world chess champion, Gary Kasparov at the time. So this AI was capable of processing 200 million moves per second. And th th this breakthrough was not due to a new paradigm, but just to, to, due to growth in compute and memory, plus some engineering uh, efforts. So uh, during that time, lots of solutions to problems were developed in the tech, tech industry, uh, solutions that, that would use data mining, uh, industrial robotics, speech recognition and even like the beginning of medical diagnosis. Uh, a lot of those methods were created under this name of machine learning. So uh, what, what's the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence is, is really this, um, this, this whole field, right? This universe of techniques that enable machines to mimic human behavior. Machine learning is a subset of AI uh, that includes the techniques that can learn without being explicitly programmed, techniques that can learn from data. And after 2011, uh, three major factors came into play that uh, were responsible for, for major breakthroughs. First, we had access, we started to have access to much larger amounts of data, faster and cheaper computers, and lots of advances in machine learning techniques which allowed us to train something called neural networks. So uh, machine learning has now this, this um, subfield called deep learning. Deep learning is, is, is really the machine learning for large neural networks. The advantage of these neural networks is that they can extract patterns from data without you telling which features, which um, attributes of the data are important to look at. They can extract this directly from images, time series, sounds, uh, mute music. So it has really uh, reshaped. Uh, and, and this is pretty much what people uh, are calling today as AI. So AI is most of the time just this deep neural network that is running behind uh, virtual assistants, self-driving cars, chat GPT, uh, mid journey, this is for, for kind of designing uh, graphic design and, and even drug discovery nowadays. Okay, so that was a brief history of AI. Now I'm gonna cover in very quickly how AI models can learn from data and what are their applications in health, education and the workplace, some ethical considerations and what to expect next. So let, let's begin with uh, how we can train neural networks. How can AI models learn from data? These artificial neural networks, uh, it might not come as a surprise, they're inspired on biological neural networks. They're inspired on the brain. So if you remember your biology class, right? Uh, this is a biological neuron and it has dendrites, which are these receptors, receptors from other neurons, a cell body, uh, which, which uh, essentially um, co collects, aggregates the, the information coming from the dendrites, and the axon, which transmits impulses to, to other neurons. 
So when you're looking at something, the optical nerve captures uh, a bunch of information. This information becomes electric impulses that uh, reach the dendrites of the neurons. And this is, is, is considered the input to the neuron. And, and then these impulses are combined here in the cell body. And after the, 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 if the combined signal surpasses a certain threshold, then the neuron is going to fire an impulse. And that impulse is the output of the neuron that gets carried to other neurons. So now let's look at uh, the artificial neuron. So the artificial neuron could look something like this, where I have these connections, which represent the dendrites, right? So these are, these connections can have different thickness. So this thickness uh, indicate whether they, uh, whether they exaggerate or they, they, they kind of retain some of the signal that is coming from the dendrites. So you can think of that as multipliers, right? Or I can multiply by numbers uh, larger than one, smaller than one, and I can even have some negative uh, connections. So the connections that inhibit the final signal. So these connections are going to have negative weights. So I, I can take some sort of input, for example, the image of a cat, and convert that to uh, numerical values. In this example, this just illustration is two, one, 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 zero. And the way the neuron, the artificial neuron combines these inputs is simply by taking each of these input values and multiplying by the, the, the connection weight. So I, I have two times one, and then I sum all these, these um, weighted inputs. So I have two times one, plus one times three, plus one times two, and so on. So if you, if you combine all these inputs, then we get three. Let's say that we get three. Similar to a biological neuron, we're gonna compare that with a threshold and if it's above the threshold, then we're gonna output something. We're gonna output, for example, one for a cat or a zero for a dog. This, was, this will be a neuron that distinguishes between images of cats or dogs, okay? So in that case, since uh, three is greater than zero, it outputs cat. In sum, a neuron performs uh, some sort of neuro, uh, numerical computation. You have an input, which is just a list of numbers, and you have an output, which is a number or a label. In this case, a dog or dog or cat. Uh, it turns out that the, the this computation can be very neatly expressed as a matrix multiplication. So you can take this matrix, multiply by this matrix, and uh, and that is going to give us the same result. The only reason I'm mentioning this is not uh, to make you feel bad about not remember the matrix multiplication is that the graphical cards that we have in today's computers, they're very good at matrix multiplication. They can do it extremely fast. And the fact that uh, all these operations can be turned into uh, matrix uh, operations uh, makes, it, makes it possible, possible to, do, to use neural networks nowadays. Well, uh, you may imagine that uh, distinguish between cats and dogs would be very hard to do with a single neuron. You have many different kinds of images. Uh, so if you think that an, a, neur a neuron is doing computing some sort of mathematical function, it represents a mathematical function, you can combine several neurons in layers to represent very complex mathematical functions. So now we have the same inputs that we had before. And instead of using just one neuron, I have a layer full of neurons. And I can have more than one layer. I can uh, have a sequence of transformations, right? So these are uh, matrix matrix multiplications, which finally give me an output, some sort of prediction. Okay. So how do we train a neural network to, uh, to, to classify images, or to generate sentences. First, step number one, you need to collect large amounts of data. So this is what these companies have been doing. They, they're collecting lo lots of data from books that have been digitalized from Wikipedia, Twitter, which is now called X, Instagram. And then we can, for example, collect this image of a blueberry, blueberry muffins 
and chihuahuas and train a network that will distinguish between blueberry muffins and chihuahuas, which is not an easy task. It's uh, looking at this one, it's uh, unclear. So uh, if we wanna train a network to do whatever task, right? So this is obviously not the most useful one. First of all, you have to transform the data into numerical values. So in grayscale, it could look like a, a matrix like this. So then we plug these numerical values as the input. And in the beginning, the neural network is initialized at random. So just with random weights, and it's not gonna do very well. It might say, well, this is a chihuahua with probability 0 0.9, uh, which, is, which, which is terrible. So in order to train the network, we're going to compare the response, the, the, the predictions with the, the true responses, the true uh, values. And we will change network parameters, change those weights, the minus four plus two that are uh, associated with these connections in order to minimize the error. It's a process similar to the brain where the brain, our brain is learning something by enforcing some connections and, 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 and deeming some others. So this training process uh, is done based on an algorithm called backpropagation, which uses uh, derivatives, derivatives from calculus to determine how each weight affects the output. And we want to change the weight so that it, it makes the predictions as, as good as possible. So then we're gonna go from 0 0.9 to 0 0.75. And if we have enough data, eventually, we're gonna say this is not a chihuahua, okay? This is a blueberry muffin. So ChatGPT is a large language model and large language models are neural networks. These are huge neural networks that can generate human-like text. So uh, it is, uh, th these large language models are trained with extremely large amounts of, of text. One example is, is called Falcon. Falcon is uh, Falcon was trained with 3.5 trillion tokens. Tokens are essentially words or parts of words. So, um, in addition to training, like it, like in the slide that I showed you before, uh, for large language models, you you need a human in the loop, so that the the the, the model learns how to interact well with users, how to have a conversation, a dialogue. So you can take a large language model and we can ask questions, right? We can use for question answering. And for example, we can take a sentence, when was Shrewsbury, Massachusetts established and break that into small tokens. So these tokens are essentially words and we feed these words to the model. The model is, is gonna use the weights that have been learned through this very expensive process. This process can cost up to a hundred million dollars. And we'll, start generating words one at a time. The next word will depend on the previous word. And if we are lucky, it might give us the right answer. It might say Shrewsbury, Massachusetts was established in 1727. Uh, however, we have no guarantee that these answers are correct. In practice, the models learn how to generate sentences that are that sound real, that seem reasonable, right? So it might uh, end up mixing with other cities in Massachusetts. It might, um, so it, it's probably not a good idea to get medical advice from ChatGPT or legal advice. You, you, you might have seen these disclaimers everywhere. Well, uh, clearly AI is, is everywhere, uh, but sometimes in, even in things that we don't realize. For example, here's a like a normal routine from someone who wakes up and checks uh, the ETA on Google Maps to see how long it's going to take to go to work. Is there traffic? Uh, which should be the best path? So Google Maps is using very uh, complex neural networks to calculate, to estimate the time you're going to take to get to work. Then uh, once you once you are at work, the thermostat in your home, I realize that you're not home and just turn it, turn off the heating. Then the robo vacuum uh, comes out of its cage and then it starts starts cleaning uh, and realizes that some 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 
there are some patches that are dirtier and then it goes more carefully over those and and just uh, passes briefly over some other that are, that are already clean. And he has this map, it's kind of sensing obstacles along the way. Uh, so now after work, you, you, you might go home and then I call my wife from the car, I use Siri perhaps to call her. And then she tells me, well, uh, we don't have anything for dinner. Can you stop at Trader Joe's? Then I stop at Trader Joe's to get dumplings, but I never go to Trader Joe's. So when I, when, when I get to the cashier to pay for the, my purchase for my groceries, then my credit card gets blocked. There's no one checking my purchases, right? This is, this is really AI determining whether this is a plausible purchase or not. If I never go to Trader Joe's, if I then it might suspect that maybe there's something off there. And that's when you get frustrated, like you're trying to pay for something and then you cannot pay, or, um, you really want to get home, all, all that, that's all that you want. Then after dinner, you might relax and, and watch some of the Netflix recommendations. So these are not uh, human curated recommendations, these are also based on, on user preferences. Uh, we also use AI in the workplace every day, um, even so this one applies to most people if you have to answer emails if you're spend part of your day reading and answering emails even the spam filter right that distinguishes between what goes in your inbox and what goes to spam is is essentially looking at the text right automatically and determining whether looking at the subjects looking at the the, uh, the sources and determining if it's spam or not uh, if you're typing, there is auto uh, auto correct. There's auto complete. If you are, uh, I'm not a native speaker, so every now and then I have to use Google Translate to express certain sentences that I don't know how to say correctly, or I can type draft an entire email and just ask ChatGPT to improve it. Uh, so these are examples which could be common to to a lot of people. But if you're in specific professions, like if you are a graphic designer, then uh, I have a friend who is a graphic designer in Toronto, and he tells me, I now I start my, my, my uh, a piece of work from a prompt. So I, I tried this uh, yesterday. So I typed a library auditorium from a small town full of adults and high schoolers listening to a talk about AI. So that's the image that it generated okay. and, and took uh, 10 seconds at most to generate this image. So then what my friend in Toronto does is to edit pixels and regions of the image, but he starts from, from something like this, right? Uh, a programmer, many, many programmers, they, um, they're gonna use Copilot, which is a GitHub um, uh, AI assistant to, to sketch uh, the beginning of their code and then they will make changes, they will adapt based on, on this, this sketch, right? And uh, musicians, they, they can uh, record a song and then correct imperfections using AI. Now, moving on to education. Uh, since 2022, we educators have been concerned about ChatGPT. Uh, it's very good at generating essays, writes really well, uh, but somehow they don't feel authentic. I, I can tell uh, just looking at an essay whether it has been written entirely written by ChatGPT or not. Uh, if uh, so, uh, the other thing is it's not very good at math. So if you have to do things like counting, summing numbers, it doesn't do so well. Uh, so it's it, it's a big challenge, and and we're just learning how to deal with these new technologies in in education. On the bright side, uh, there are platforms like Assistments. This is a platform developed by a colleague at WPI, New Heffernan. And this platform can uh, use this AI to derive instructional insights, uh, provide customized tutoring for students who are struggling, and even assess the effectiveness of teaching strategies. So these are very cool things that you can do in the educational realm using, using AI. In healthcare, uh, you're probably familiar with the idea of robotic surgery, uh, but um, I think in a few, 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 year, few years ago from now uh, until now, we're seeing a lot of uh, 
improvements in terms of medical diagnosis, diagnosis from, from image, from medical notes. Uh, and here is one example from a journal called Sensors, uh, came out in 2021, where they are looking at chest x-rays and trying to learn a neural network that can identify patients who have COVID. Uh, so, and, and then the model can even point out to specific regions of the image, which explain that particular prediction. Uh, one of the things that I find most exciting now in, in healthcare is this idea of accelerated drug discovery. So in 2020, uh, this paper here came out in Cell, so that, that's a very prestigious journal, uh, describing a deep learning approach to antibiotic discovery. So essentially what they did is they took a bunch of molecules. So these are uh, potential antibiotics, uh, potential drugs, and, and they trained an AI model to make predictions about these, these particular molecules, okay? So in the beginning, uh, the AI model will do pretty poorly, but we use the predictions to refine, to train the model, we compare with the correct answers, and after the model converges, then we will be able to make predictions not only about the, uh, the molecules that are used for training the model, but also for molecules that have not been seen yet, molecules that have not been synthesized yet. So I can use the AI model to rank a bunch of candidate molecules for a new antibiotic and have the uh, people with the biomedical uh, background to, to do the screening process and determine which ones are in fact uh, efficient, efficient medications. Now, um, not everything is, is great about AI. There are many ethical considerations that we, we, we only started to, uh, to, to think about now. So uh, one of the aspects is really accountability. If you have a self-driving car that gets involved in an accident, and there have been some, some news uh, in, in the past few years, who is the culprit, right? Is it the programmer? who uh, didn't consider some corner cases? Is it uh, the company? Is it um, the, the driver who was behind the car or behind the wheel? So these are, these are questions that we, we don't know how to answer completely. There are also issues involving copyright and privacy issues. Um, so if um, I generate art using AI trained on other people's works, even though this, this image has never uh, been seen before, it's a completely new image. Can this art be considered original? Does it violate some copyright uh, regulations? The other uh, question that uh, if you're concerned about privacy, how can you determine if the AI wasn't trained using your data, right? Uh, how can you determine that if Siri is not using, didn't use your, your voice, to, uh, I don't know, how, uh, in, in their new release, right? It's, these are, we, don't, we don't have a good way to tell. Uh, other ethical considerations include transparency. If uh, you apply for a loan and you get rejected, uh, right, so you may want to know why, why did my loan get denied? Or even if the bank doesn't have the obligation to tell, uh, to explain why this is the case, the bank wants to know why the model reached that decision, right? I want to be able to uh, understand the reasoning behind the model. And there are also considerations regarding biases. Uh, one question that arises very frequently is, uh, are minoritized populations being harmed by AI predictions? Some of these models have been trained on data that, um, that that is imbalanced in the sense that most of the data are coming from perhaps white males and and then if you apply that to a different subpopulation the model might not do pretty well right now uh in terms of future trends so i i'm gonna just talk about three of them uh, which I, I find very exciting so there there is uh, uh 
currently some research going on in AI videos, videos that are completely generated by AI. Uh, in fact, yesterday, Kanye West, I, you may not be a fan, but he ha has just released a trailer from a clip called Vultures. And that trailer, all the, all the images, all the video in that trailer has, has been AI uh, generated by AI. Uh, I'm going to try to play here. Let's see if this is going to work. And perhaps you can tell me if uh, you can hear the sound. Uh, if you cannot hear the sound, I, I, I can share my screen again and, and see, uh, see if it's going to work. Okay, so bear with me. Let's see. Raise your hand if you can hear the sounds. Oh, excellent. So this is some technology that is being developed by Google Research. All the videos here are AI generated. Basically, you write a prompt, same way they generate the library image. And this is the astronaut. I love this one, the dog with the funny glasses. Uh, you can take an image, make it, make a video. Uh, there's some some uh, more interesting stuff coming up soon. There is, you can use an image as a style. So this is a stylized generation, and then you can generate anything based on like a horse galloping using that same style, a bear dancing. It's amazing to think that no one has actually created those animations, right? So this is just, uh, you provide any, any style and, and a prompt, and you can do all of these things. The other one that is very interesting is the is idea of uh, editing a video, editing an image or editing a video. For so this one in particular with a girl with a dress, then you say a different dress. And voila. Uh, even things that do not exist, like a person covered with flowers or toy blocks. Uh, so these are all types of things that you, you can do with uh, uh, this, this uh, technology called Lumiere. Uh, in terms of uh, medical LLMs, uh, as I said in the beginning, it's not advised to, to ask uh, medical advice I'm sorry, I do not recommend people to ask for medical advice to uh, chat GPT, but, uh, but companies like Microsoft, they're putting a lot of investment, they're doing a lot of research in terms of specialized large language models for the medical domain. So really, chat GPT like doctors where you can reliably get information, right? Uh, this is very promising, and I believe that in the future, it's going to reduce waiting times for doctors, we all know. It's very difficult to get appointments, even with our PCPs. And uh, the other thing I find very exciting is the idea of digital avatars. So I'm gonna play very quickly this interview with um, Lex Friedman. He's a famous, has a famous podcast. He's interviewing Mark Zuckerberg in the metaverse. And they, they just use this, this technology uh, change. to create a, like a, uh, uh, to create an avatar, a 3D avatar, right? And it doesn't feel awkward to be really close to you. No, it does. I actually moved you. I moved you back a few feet before you got into well, the headset. You were like right here. I don't know if people can see this, but this is incredible. The realism here is just incredible. Where am I? Where are you, Mark? Where 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 are we? You're in Austin, right? No, I mean this place. <laughs> where? 3D immersive video okay, of, okay. of a whole scene. So like I'll stop this. here. Uh, very interesting video. Uh, and, and the reason why this is possible is that you, you create this scan and then the video is not being transmitted from, from one person to the other. It's really um, uh, taking, taking the, the things that you're saying and just generating the facial expressions, sometimes exaggerating uh, the facial expressions. And imagine that in the future we... we Instead of giving this talk on Zoom, right, we would all be at home, but we could just uh, have the impression that we are all under the same environment, right? I could, I could look around and see everyone's expressions, and I could hardly distinguish that from, from reality. Sounds very crazy, right? Uh, 
but maybe uh, in the future, work the workplace will be a little more like this. Uh, we, we can sometimes feel the barriers when we are working with people remotely, but if we all feel like we are in the same place, then maybe uh, we're going to become more productive. Uh, I, I mean, okay. Wrapping up, uh, key takeaways. So AI has been around for a long time and it has seen many ups and downs. Uh, currently, we're, we're living in this moment of hype. Uh, what people call AI now are in reality, most of the time, neural networks. We saw how artificial neuro neurons work. So they take numerical inputs and compute outputs using matrix operations. They can learn uh, by using a bunch of data and adjusting their weights so that the predictions match the data. AI is everywhere, even though sometimes so where, it. So where do you think but generative AI will be in 10 years? That it just, will it have uh, that we just started to work out? Replacing people's jobs by then? Or do you and expect it to I, sort I, of I do believe that AI improve. is reshaping little by little. Yeah, the that's, that's a great question. And it's a matter of concern for a lot of people. Other and um, that's my that's guess that here would not be listening. much better Thanks than anyone else's guess. Uh, coming to the talk. Um, so and I, would like I to think it's important to understand what generative AI does, right? And what it doesn't. So it um, generative AI has everything to do with it, generating images, generating digital content like movies. And uh, it's currently um, it's currently be currently being used in movies. Uh, there, there was this, this major issue in in uh, California in California about um, I forgot what what those people who are hired to to disappear in behind like in, in the scenes uh, because now instead of being hired for the entire movie they are hired uh, for maybe maybe a week or so and then all the other images in the movie are, are generated right so. Uh, with, with the images of the same people. Uh, so for some of the jobs, this is already happening. So generative AI is, I, I just need to capture the image of these people and then I, I can generate more images. Uh, but for some others, I, um, it, it's not, it's not going to be immediate. It's, uh, I know you're asking 10 years from now and, uh, at the stage that we are right now, there are a lot of things that cannot be done. And, it, and somehow we cannot express what we want the AI to do. Right? There is this, this kind of language barrier and where we, we are able to express the basic thing and given some sketch, then we do some adjustments. Uh, so we cannot replace programmers by AI. I cannot take uh, like a manager, a business manager, and, and just have that person use ChatGPT or Copilot to, to code everything. Um, so my my guess, is that, as I said, this is maybe as, as good as anyone's guess, is that in uh, um, there are still lots of jobs, still lots of jobs that are going to be around. Uh, generative AI is not, it's going to help us. It's going to work in, it's going to be like an assistive tool to help us uh, be more productive. Um, I have a question. Um, so I, um, I was, I'm just more interested in your bio because you're just down the road at WPI. Are you teaching a specific course on AI at, at the uh, college? Okay, maybe you could talk a little bit. I would, I would like to hear a little bit more about what you're actually teaching at WPI. Yeah, yeah, yes. So I'm a tenure track faculty at WPI. So that means I have both uh, teaching and research responsibilities. And uh, what I teach is very, is closely related to my research. I'm teaching a deep learning course and that has to do with uh, uh, deep neural networks. So how, how do we train neural networks to uh, to work with images, uh, to work with text as input, to work with things that looks like networks, like molecules. Uh, and part of the class is really uh, 
sort of giving the foundations, the mathematical foundations, and having the students hands-on practice in terms of uh, creating and training these this models, right? Uh, so at the end, they get to uh, choose a project and work in small teams, and they, uh, they do um, very, like, they come up with all, all these this very interesting projects, and I'm trying to remember some of them. Uh, some of them were, were trying to uh, take satellite images, uh, sort of satellite image from from before some kind of flooding and an image from after that and identifying uh, automatically identify which which areas have been flooded right uh, so this this has to do with images there's um, there is some there's always some interesting things that they do in uh, using using text uh, kind of um there, there is there is this, this this component of the course that is really developing like a research project for at, at, at the very end um it's a it's a graduate course so this is typically senior masters and phd students and what is your research on because that's probably your favorite thing to talk about i would think <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, my research tries to make AI models faster, uh, more fair, and more accurate. And a lot of that has to do with um, data that looks like molecules, looks like uh, users in a social network, uh, looking at how these objects are connected, and and using uh, using using that to uh, make predictions about sort of high impact social phenomena, computational phenomena. And uh, one, one of the things that I've been looking at with uh, some of my students is the, the fairness uh, of AI, uh, the rankings generated by AI models. So you can think that if um, uh, there is an interesting ca uh, use case, uh, some uh, like recently, uh, University of North Carolina, Harvard, they have been forbidden uh, from using from using uh, sort of sensitive attributes, for example, uh, uh, sex or race, in order to make their their admissions uh, in, in their admission process. And, and then um, you, you essentially are in a situation where maybe you have trained models that were using uh, at the same time that you want to okay at the same time that you want to be uh fair and give uh maybe give equal opportunities you are now forbidden from using uh those sensitive attributes for for privacy questions so if you have trained a model using those attributes how do you apply these models to the new data where you, where you don't see these attributes so what some companies would do is to try to infer those attributes, try to infer sex based on names or based on on other activities, right? So on, uh, and the, the the issue is that some cases, in, in sometimes these inferences are wrong, right? You would uh, think that this candidate is male, but the candidate's female, and then we were trying to understand the impact of these uh, incorrect inferences on the fairness of the final predictions the final rankings right how do you how do you instill fairness if you cannot trust uh the the inference mechanisms thank you very interesting thank you so Federico, uh, i was wondering uh we hear that from the people in uk at least concerns that the uh, ai is now thinking for itself that it's uh acting on its own without any uh, help from humans. That, that's my one question. And the second question is, I think a lot of people are really concerned. I know uh, I have a friend that's in the uh, uh, picture making industry. And of course, part of the strike that took place is if they have your image as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as an actor, they can produce you in many different ways without ever hiring you again, 
Uh, and that would be true for every public figure, that they could take images of you and have you doing things that you never did, and it's hard to tell the difference between the reality and not. So those are the two questions that I hear a lot about. Uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on those two things. Yeah, I, I'm glad you, uh, you touched on these questions. And uh, I, I'll start with the first one, and I, have, I think I have a more positive answer for that one. Uh, so the first question is, is AI currently thinking for itself? Uh, should we be concerned about uh, AI taking over uh, the world, like the, as we see in the movies? Uh, and I honestly, I, 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 this is not the case, right? So, uh, and, and I can maybe try to explain why, why, why I think, uh, why, why this is not the case. Uh, so essentially, uh, when you think about these models, these models are, they have learned from some data and we use these models to, so for some sort of decision-making for, um, and in, in many cases, uh, even though the model is perhaps controlling the stocks, uh, if you have one of those automated, uh, wallets like the, the the model is purchasing stocks is selling stocks buying and selling then the, there is some sort of overseeing right so there is people who are checking and there are safeguards to prevent this from happening prevent, uh, sort of terrible actions from happening uh we're not at the point where the ai is continuously uh, collecting things from the internet and, and just learning and, and making and taking decisions by itself without any overseeing that would, uh, would create a catastrophe, right? Um, so it, it, you have to think about how AI is being used if it's used for, uh, is, is it AI ever going to shut down a country, shut down the electricity in a country? Uh, only if uh, the people in, in that country uh, make it completely automated, right? So the AI will, will, will do such things. Uh, but we, we still have the power of deciding what, what the AI is going to do or not. It, it's like when you're using a computer where you, own, you, you don't have administration uh, uh, privileges. Uh, you, you cannot you, you cannot delete certain things. You cannot ruin the computer as a user because you don't have the administration privileges. And uh, this, this idea that the AI has a conscious and a lot of people got that idea from chat DPT because they see, oh, it's writing as a person. But it, in, in reality, it's just mimicking the way we write. It learned from a lot of text and it can write in very similar ways. It's not reasoning. Right. This is very different from reasoning. So regarding the second question, uh, I understand concerns of the picture making industry. At, and part of that will be eventually addressed by new regulations. We are still uh, just scratching the surface in terms of understanding uh, how we should do like work with copywriting and um, so this will solve part of the problems, but the other one you mentioned is more like uh, now I have this this entire this, this video and I can't tell if this is a person or or it was generated by AI, right? How um, who knows? In 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 maybe a few months from now we're gonna see this video from I don't know one of the uh, <clears throat> candidates to 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 run the presidential elections and. And we, we don't know if this is a real video or not, right? It's the same thing with the uh, text generated by ChatGPT. How can you tell if it's a person or ChatGPT? Uh, there is a, some people working on the other side, which is trying to develop techniques that would uh, take a video as input and take text as input and tell us whether this is machine generated or not. And it would look at something like, uh, the kind of the entropy in in the, in the data it will uh, look for certain metrics 
that are different for humans and for, for uh, machines, for AIs. Uh, we as humans will probably not be able to distinguish between a real video and one that is generated by AI, but there will be technology that, uh, that will assist us with that. So I have another question. Um, is it possible to use like Zoom Companion and stuff? And have you been using it to take minutes and meetings and stuff and keep track of stuff so you can free yourself up from that kind of stuff? And how well do you think it works? Uh, you mentioned a Zoom Companion? Is yeah, it's, I've only read about it online. I haven't had the chance to use it yet. It's supposedly a feature if you have the newer versions of Zoom that came out in November that'll track minutes for meetings. Um, right, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't know it was called the Zoom Companion. I actually just saw the, the, the button here on my, my window. Uh, it is... Uh, I've used similar technologies to, to uh, create, essentially transcribe everything that was in the meeting, uh, take screenshots of uh, the video when, when things change, when slides change. And it's very good at generating outlines. Uh, the one I used was not powered by Zoom, was powered by otter.ai. Okay, I found that. Yeah, otter. It's very, very useful. And especially when you have to go to particular points in the recording, then you can just click and it, it uh, you, you can look at the, the outline, click at the point, the bullet, and it goes automatically to that point. Uh, very useful. If, uh, if it's available on Zoom, I would highly recommend it. Now, have you taken the recording? Like this meeting is being recorded. Have you ever tried to take the recording from a meeting and stuffed it into Otter and see if it comes out pretty accurate or not? To get a summary, right. yeah, Otter Otter is pretty good. I, uh, I I usually just have Otter join the Zoom meetings, so uh -huh. it can probably tell better who is speaking and just assigns the names to the the the, the, the sentences, uh, which is also very useful. Okay. Isn't there other ethical considerations though around that? Because you know, typically, if you're recording a meeting it announces you're recording a meeting, right? But if you're working in any kind of environment like federal or anything where, you know, because I've run into that where you're not, you know, now you are not to record and you even try to transcribe, which even the transcribing Zoom is pretty good because it'll help with notes and that afterwards, but you have to be very mindful of the fact, you know, that if people are not aware <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, uh, we are in Massachusetts, so it's a state where dual party consent is required for recording audio. And and then if uh, if you were to have order join the meeting and record transcribe, then you have to ask for explicit permission from everyone. Mm -hmm. Are quantum computers being utilized at WPI? Uh, I know there are researchers working on quantum computing. I'm not aware if we have any quantum computer there or not. Uh, I, yeah. That, I, I could ask around. <laughs> any other questions? Should we? Well, uh, Dr. Murai's talk is the first in a series of talks that we are planning on AI. So on March 14th, we are planning a talk by um, Representative Jim McGovern and possibly Senator Michael Moore, who will probably be here to talk about uh, regulations that the government is planning um, or guardrails that have to be imposed for AI. So that's the next talk. And then in the summer, we probably have another, a third talk by on uh, the ethics of AI. We're still planning that. So stay so tuned. So will these talks all be in person or will I be, could I record them and, and join from Zoom at home? Um, I'm not sure yet. I think, we, I mean, if they can come in person, it would be nice to have it in person. I wish I could have come in person. I'm so sorry.
Thank you very much. Um, Hope to see you in the future. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for the questions. Wonderful questions. Thank you very much. Have a good night.